Welcome to this week's Midweek Refuel, where we seek out the ancient pathways in order to run faster through today's spiritual wilderness, which is getting wilder every day. I'm Pastor John Whitfield from Remnant Church in Fuquay Marina, North Carolina, and it is a pleasure to have you join us today. Please take a moment to hit the like and subscribe buttons, and I hope that this lesson is of value to you spiritually. Augustine runs up against the hard wall. Uh, the hard wall of bargaining with God. He has done the intellectual work, uh, and he's done it well enough to have a, a workable definition. I hate saying a definition of God. That becomes an idol. Um, perhaps it's a definition with more in line with negative theology than with systematic theology, but it's a definition no less that uh, gives him a framework to at least conceive of a God that must exist and in some ways to define what cannot be defined or at least to, through the definitions, map out the invisible perimeter so that we might spot the at least the, the uh, uh, circumference of what we are trying to understand. Sometimes the uh, absence or the hole that is left in logic has a shape that enlightens as to the nature of the invisible. How do you think we got quantum mechanics? It was by understanding what we couldn't look directly at by looking at something over on the side. You can only see the invisible man when the invisible man is being rained on or having something thrown on him. You don't ever see him, but you do kind of. Uh, Augustine writes this, quote, I had now found the great pearl. It remained for me to sell all I had and buy it. And that I could not do, unquote. This, of course, is in reference to the parable of the pearl of great price in Matthew 13, which says, quote, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it, unquote. I had always interpreted this parable to mean that a wise person, any wise person, someone who had hunted for wisdom, somebody who looked for wisdom, would give all that they had to obtain the wisdom for salvation or the wisdom of God. The, the merchant seemed to me to be of no special interest. He was just a, a placeholder, a, a, a seeker of pearls. And once he had found the best pearl in existence, well, he happil, happily and deliriously and by necessity of his passion sold all he owned to have it. So I just always put everybody in the place of that. But Augustine reminds me that's not true. So in, in my interpretation of that scripture, I imagine an irresistible goodness that cannot be fought, even if it cost everything to obtain it. It was the pearl that had value and power in my interpretation. The, the merchant was just a guy who lucked out. And I don't like using that language either, but narratively, that's the way I describe it. Augustine, however, likens himself to the merchant, but gives the story a twist ending like M. Night. He finds the pearl, but alarmingly finds that he is unwilling to pay the price for the pearl of great price. And what price would that be? What what kept him from buying the pearl of great price? Any guesses? First three don't count. Well, let's hear what he has to say about it. He dictates, quote, I had no pleasure in my worldly business, and it was now a great burden on me, for I was no longer set on fire by my familiar desires, the hope of high office or wealth. To endure such heavy servitude, such things held no delight for me compared with your sweetness and the beauty of your house, which I loved, but I was still caught fast in my entanglement with womankind, <laughs> unquote. Yeah, sex, go figure, right? Raise your hand if you had that one figured out ahead of time. <laughs> Near the beginning of our reading, he says, quote, I had chosen the way, who is our savior, but was still reluctant to pass through the narrow places of that way, unquote. Throughout this uh, discussion, this reading, we are uh, introduced to characters who all have their unique weaknesses, and we all have our unique weaknesses. For Augustine, it's womankind. For Victor Victorinus, it was the pride of place amongst the pagans. He was ashamed to have childlike kingdom faith in the uh, convoluted 
pagan philosophies. For the Roman people, it was the tendency to mix religions together and accept anything and everything pridefully, except for, of course, the middle and narrow and restrictive path of Christ, um, which they must overthrow or they feel they must overthrow. Each of us is pulled our own way and bent towards our own desires, and each of us has our own weaknesses to account for. Uh, God has already told you yours, and you have done one or two things with that knowledge. You have sold all you own for the pearl of great price, or you have refused to make the transaction. Um, I find that a very interesting way to interpret the merchant who seeks the pearl. I, I'm thankful for Augustine and his uh, unique to me view on it. Uh, because when I first read it, I think to myself, who doesn't like pearls? You know, I mean, they're pearls. Oh, yeah. There are some scriptures on that, too. Matthew 7, 6 says, do not give what is holy to a dog nor cast your pearl before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces, unquote. So I now have a fuller understanding of Jesus's parable, thanks to Augustine. The, the pearl is undeniable. It is valuable, but it is only undeniable to the merchant who can even comprehend its value. If the merchant happens to be a hog, then the pearl is nowhere near as valuable as the slop and the mud is to that hog. And that's just the way pigs are. <laughs> Unfortunately, all of us have been swine at some point in our lives, just as Augustine, Victorinus, and those who worship the gods of Egypt within the gates of Rome. We are not in good company, but we aren't alone either. Far from it. In a, poem, in a poem by Virgil, the following is said about how the Romans thought of the Egyptian gods, those monstrous deities, mongrel gods be god of every breed, barking Anubis, who against Neptune and Venus and Minerva once wielded their weapons. God's control and God's fight, it is what they do. You might think you are an atheist and free of the gods, but something does control you. Some thought, some desire, some fear, some lie. Something controls you. Your hatred of God may control you. And that is that thing, that thought is your God. When gods ask you to act like dogs and gods ask you to act like swine, then that God is a mongrel God. It will run after any thrown ball. It will chase after any car. It will sniff any. Well, you get the picture. Who are you? Are you a pig wearing a merchant suit? Or are you a naked merchant who sold his suit to a pig to get a pearl? I have only scratched the surface of these chapters. They're rich. But we have a healthy size reading to do today. Turn to book eight and we will read through chapter two. My God, may I recall with thanksgiving and confess to you your mercies towards me. Let my bones be steeped in your love and let them say, Lord, who is like unto you? You have burst my bonds and I would offer to you the sacrifice of praise. How you burst them, I shall tell. And all who worship you, will they hear it? shall say, Blessed be the Lord God in heaven and on earth, great and marvelous is his name. Your words had lodged deep in my being, and you hemmed me in on every side. Concerning your eternal life, I was certain, even though I saw it in a glass darkly. As for the incorruptibility of your substance, all my uncertainty on that score had been taken from me since I saw that every substance comes from your substance. I desired not to be more certain about you, but to stand more firmly in you. But concerning my temporal life, all was uncertain. My heart was yet to be cleansed of the old leaven. I had chosen the way, who is our Savior, but was still reluctant to pass through the narrow places of that way. Then you put a thought into my mind, and it seemed good in my sight to go straight to Simplicianus. It was clear to me that he was a good servant of yours. In him, your grace shone out. I had heard that from his youth, he had lived a life of complete devotion to you. He was now an old man, and 
given his great age and the devout zeal with which he followed your way, I was sure he had experienced much and had learnt much. And so it was. I wanted, therefore, to share with him the ebb and flow of my uncertainties and to hear from him what was the proper middle course for one affected as I was so that I could walk in your way. I, I could see that the church was full of people, each according to their own sort. I had no pleasure in my worldly business, and it was now a great burden on me, for I was no longer set on fire by the familiar desires, the hope for high office or wealth to endure such heavy servitude. Such things held no delight for me compared with your sweetness and the beauty of your house, which I loved, but I was still caught fast in my entanglement with womankind. Your apostle did not forbid me to marry, but he urged me to better things and would have all men to be as he was. In my weakness, I chose a more comfortable spot. And for this one reason, I was tossed around with sickness and all other matters, consumed and wasting away with anxieties. Being bound over to the conjugal life, I was forced to conform to it, even in respect of things I had no wish to undergo. I had heard from the mouth of truth that there are eunuchs who had made themselves so for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, but let him receive this who can receive it. It is certain that all men are vain in whom there is no knowledge of God, nor from among the things that seem good have they been able to find him who is. I was not now in that state of vanity. I had transcended it, and by the universal testimony of all creation had found you, our creator, and your word who is with you, and with you is one God, through whom you have created all things, and there is another sort of impiety, that of those who, knowing God, have not worshipped him as God nor given thanks. Into this error, too, I had fallen. But your right hand raised me up, took me from it, and set me in a place where I could recover. For you have said to man, Behold, piety is wisdom, and do not wish to appear wise. For saying they are wise, they have made themselves fools. I had now found the great pearl. It remained for me to sell all I had and buy it. And that I could not do. Therefore, I went directly to Simplicianus, who was the father of the current bishop, Ambrose, by virtue of baptism, and whom Ambrose indeed loved as a father. I told him of the circuitous paths in which I had strayed. But when I mentioned the fact that I had read various books of the Platonist persuasion, translated into Latin by Victorinus, the sometime city orator at Rome, who, as I had heard, had died a Christian, Simplicianus congratulated me on not having stumbled on the literature of other philosophers. They were, he said, full of fallacies and deceits, according to the elements of this world, where the Platonist literature hinted in every way at God and his word. Then, by way of exhorting me to the humility of Christ, which is hidden from the wise and revealed to the little children, he gave me his own recollections of Victorinus himself, whom he had known very well when he was at Rome, and he told me a story about him that I will not keep to myself. For I am bound to confess and offer great praise to your grace for Victorinus's action. He was an old man of great learning, most skilled in every liberal art, who had read and evaluated the works of so many philosophers. He had taught a great many noble senators, and in reward for his distinguished discharge of his office as teacher had been granted what the citizens of this world deemed the highest honor of all, namely a statue in the form of Rome. He had, until his old age, been a worshiper of idols and a participant in the sacrilegious rites with which, at that time, the vast majority of Roman nobility were full, the rites in which they sighed for the infant Osiris, for those monstrous deities, mongrel gods begot of every breed, barking Anubis, who, against Neptune and Venus and Minerva, once wielded their weapons. These were the gods whom Rome had once conquered and whose aid she now implored. And for many years, old Victorinus had defended them with thunderous eloquence, but he was not ashamed to become a child of Christ, an infant at your font, font bending his neck to the yoke of humility and conquering his pride before the reproach of the cross. O oh Lord, Lord, 
who bowed down the heavens and descended, who touched the mountains and they smote. By what means did you steal into Victorinus's heart? He was reading, according to Simplicianus, the Holy Scriptures and making a most thorough inspection and scrutiny of the whole of Christian literature and would say to Simplicianus, not openly, but as between friends, rest assured that I am now a Christian. Simplicianus would reply, I shall not believe it or set you down as a Christian until I see you in the church of Christ. And Victorinus would laugh at him and say, is it then walls that make a Christian? He would often say the same thing that he was now, that he was now a Christian and Simplicianus would make the same reply and get the same jibe about walls in return. Victorinus was afraid of offending his friends those proud worshipers of demons, thinking that enmity would come crashing down upon him from the heights of their Babylonian elevation, as if from the cedars of Lebanon, which the Lord has not yet laid low. But having read and drunk in the scriptures and accepted their trustworthiness, he became afraid of being denied by Christ before the holy angels, if he was afraid to confess him before men. And it became apparent to him that he was guilty of a great crime and being ashamed of the mysteries of your humility, but not of the sacrilegious rites of the proud demons, which he had received by tradition and proudly imitated. Accordingly, he put off his shame for vanity and blushed for the truth. And suddenly and unexpectedly, he said to Simplicianus, let us go to church. I want to become a Christian. Unable to contain himself for joy, Simplicianus set off with him. Not long after he had been steeped in the first mysteries of instructions, he also enrolled for regeneration through baptism. Rome wondered. The church rejoiced. The proud saw it and were wroth. They gnashed with their teeth and were consumed away. But to your servant, the Lord God was his hope, nor did he give heed to vanities and lying follies. When at last the moment came for him to make his profession of faith, which at Rome it is customary for all who are to proceed to your grace to repeat according to a form of words that they have learnt by heart from a prominent position in sight of the faithful, Simplicianus told me that the priest offered Victorinus the opportunity to repeat it in a more private setting, an offer usually made to those who are likely to hesitate out of shyness. Victorinus, however, preferred to profess his salvation in the sight of the saintly multitude, for it was not salvation that he taught in his duties as professor of rhetoric, but he had made a public profession of that. How much less then ought he to fear to pronounce your word before your tame flock, having been unafraid to address the mad crowds in his own words? So he went up to repeat the profession, and as each one present recognized him, all whispered his name to each other in a hubbub of mutual delight, and who there did not recognize him. A hushed cheer of shared joy rang through the mouth of all, Victorinus, Victorinus, suddenly they cheered in exultation of seeing him, then at once fell silent in anticipation of hearing him. He made his pronouncement of the true faith with the plainest assurance, and all wished to take him into their hearts. This they did with love and rejoicing. These were the hands that took him in. If you go to a church that has a wide gate, then I suggest for your own love of your own soul that you ask yourself if God has spoken with you personally about something. Not the preacher, not the Sunday school teacher, but has God himself put his finger on a place in your heart and said, give me that and I'll give you a pearl. Has God offered you a pearl, told you what it would cost and you couldn't bring yourself to do it? And so you found like-minded people through a large gate willing to live in a delusion and help you live there as well? The gate is narrow and few there are that find it. Learn from St. Augustine. Just because you don't like it doesn't mean it isn't true. And just because you don't value it doesn't make it worthless. Wisdom, wisdom is an acquired taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Christ is king. Hail to the king.